Hello, I'm David Bull. I'm a medical doctor and a journalist, and I welcome you to this MDFM oncology debate on metronomic chemotherapy in breast cancer. Well, we're in Paris in the MDFM TV studio, and first of all, I am absolutely thrilled to introduce you to Marina Casaniga, who is Professor of Oncology in Milana Biocha School of Medicine and Surgery and Director of Phase One Research Center at San Gerardo Hospital in Monza, Italy, and a well-known specialist of metronomic chemotherapy. Now, Italy is a country where metronomic chemotherapy is frequently used. So, Marina, I'm really hoping that you'll be able to guide us through uh, this particular subject. Thank you very much, David. It's a great honor for me to be here today and uh, to share with you and uh, uh, my colleagues uh, all uh, the details about uh, this kind of new therapy. Perfect. So, Marina, perhaps we can start right at the beginning. Is there a precise definition of metronomic chemotherapy? Yes, there is, David. Uh, uh, metronomic chemotherapy is defined as uh, uh, the, the drug dose used uh, to obtain a biological effect. It means that uh, it's uh, quite a new way to define uh, the dose for a drug, and this is uh, one of the new concepts for metronomic chemotherapy. And if I'm right in thinking that it's named after the fact it's a metronome, you're giving it regular intervals, a lower dose of chemotherapy, and there are benefits to that? For sure. The, in the metronomic administration, the drugs are used in a very low dose, and that's why we have very less toxicity, very good toxicity for our patients. But at the same time, the doses of the drugs we deliver are able to kill a cancer cell. So we have activity from one side and less toxicity from the other side. Well, it all sounds rather marvellous. But so, so what are your aims then when you're using metronomic chemotherapy? I assume it's actually to keep the disease in remission or to get the disease into remission. Sure. The main aim is to have a prolonged disease control. It means that the patients, you know, cannot understand what is overall survival, for example. But they are well able to understand what means have their symptoms under control for a very long period of time. So the main aim is to have disease control. And we can reach the same by killing the cancer cells directly, or we can have an action on the tumor microenvironment. In some cases, we have both, and for sure, this is an advantage. Okay, so it's all about controlling the disease, having a lower dose, and also making it better for the patient generally. Sure, the doses used are very, very below the doses usually administered in the, in the maximum tolerated dose chemotherapy, and that's why we are able to have a very few toxicities in our yeah. patients. Fantastic. We'll come on to this in just a little bit more. Uh, uh, but um, now, in order to discuss this promising strategy, we have the great pleasure to have with us a European panel of experts in this field. Firstly, Pedro Sanchez Rivera. Hello, you're Professor of Oncology, Head of Oncology Unit at Yain Hospital in Spain. Uh, we've also got Peter Wykowski. Hello, you're Professor of Oncology, Head of Oncology Unit at the Jagolian University and Medical College in Krakow in Poland. And last, but by no means least, mm -hmm. Joseph Sicolini. Now, you are Assistant Professor of Clinical Pharmacology in mm -hmm. Latimone Hospital at the University of A. Marseille in France. <coughs> and I'm delighted uh, that you're all here, so thank you mm -hmm. very much uh, indeed. So let's just start with you again, Marina. Um, if we try to put this into perspective, when we're looking at breast cancer, um, when the endocrine-based regimens that we often treat breast cancer uh, have been exhausted, there's clearly a lot of chemotherapy options out there. Sure. So what options are available at this point? There are a lot of options, as you said, but uh, all the guidelines do not recommend one precise drug over another one. So I think that metronomic chemotherapy can be a concrete possibility for our patient because now we have data that it works very well in first line chemotherapy setting. Okay, well, let's go back to traditional therapeutics. So Peter, perhaps you'd like to say, what are the benefits of using chemotherapy as it stands, clearly with as we do at the moment, the maximum tolerated dose? Well, actually, the maximum tolerated dose defines a really aggressive treatment because this is the maximum dose of chemotherapy that we can administer to our patients uh, that can be 
uh, standard by them. So it means that we try to be very aggressive, to be very hard uh, to fight the disease. But uh, sometimes it's really important when the patients are symptomatic, when the disease progresses rapidly, when we see that there is a risk of uh, uh, decompensation of uh, organ function. So we have to be very aggressive and very rapid. And then we use those aggressive treatments. But in the case of majority of breast cancer patients, we don't see this kind of rapidly progressing disease. And this is then the option for metronomic chemotherapy strategies. Right, that's interesting. Would yes. you agree with that? Yes, yes. Maybe in the following this, uh, this line, it's uh, maybe the limitations of the, the, of the standard chemo, the toxicity of the treatments. And so, so you're talking about maximum tolerated dose yes, chemotherapy? Yes, yes. Because there clearly are side yeah. effects to that. Uh -huh. Yeah, and that the, if you use, for example, metronomic schedules, we have not this, this problem with the toxicity. And we have a more high index, therapeutic index. And uh, in, uh, if you can prolong the treatments, we, we know data uh, about the, uh, the chemotherapy. If you uh, achieve a prolonged treatments, maybe we can improve the, uh, the survival of the patient, but we have the problems with the toxicity. Metronomic treatments offer the possibility to uh, prolong the, the disease progression without the toxicity of the standards. And the toxicity with the MTD is, is a real problem, isn't it? Because you have to give prolonged rest periods, the patients feel absolutely terrible, yeah. um, and therefore the, there is a chance then that the, the tumour can regrow or possibly become resistant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, but um, with the metronomic studies, maybe we, we can offer different mechanisms of action. And uh, it's a way to, to, to have not this kind of the resistances uh, that we have with uh, the standard chemotherapy. Okay, Joseph, I'm coming to you now So as, the, as my pharmacologist. So, why, so given that the mainstay of treatment has been the maximum tolerated mm -hmm. dose, how come suddenly, or at least what feels to be suddenly, are we moving away? You know, perhaps you'd like to pick up on some of the points the other gentlemen have raised. Yeah, actually, uh, well, there are several reasons. Uh, the first is the change of paradigm, you know, in, in the way we see uh, what, what cancer treatment should be. Uh, for decades, uh, indeed, the main target was the cancer cell, and we had to destroy the cancer cell, and we needed to eat strong, rapidly, and heavily. And now, you know, in addition to cancer cell, uh, supporting trauma, for instance, you know, uh, is considered as a new target, and by, you know, shifting from MTD protocol to metronomic protocol, uh, as Peter said, uh, we have new mechanism of actions because uh, quite strangely, the uh, same drug given at a low dosage is going to change its behavior and is going to change its mechanism of action. And, and a drug which was... Did we know that before or was this stumbled upon? Well, I mean, we... we <laughs> it all started, you know, in, in the 90s with Bob Kerbel and, 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 uh, and even Judah Falkman works, you know, where, for instance, you know, small, low levels of cytotoxics are not cytotoxic anymore, but they turn to be antiangiogenics, for instance. And, and that was how it started, you know, it, mm -hmm. it all started from this, this, this observation. And now, you know, with the total craze of immunotherapy, we find out that uh, low levels of cytotoxic can, can, you know, can have some kind of immunomodulating effects. So that's a complete change you know, in the way we, we see those drugs. And, 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 and we've just found out that very old drugs have new properties, uh, provided that they are used in a different manner. So that's, that's the main support of metronomics. And, and at the end, okay, it's, it's all related to improving the efficacy toxicity balance because it's better tolerated. You've got novel mechanisms of actions. Mm. It's much more conservative, you know, uh, especially with regards of the, uh, the, immune, uh, the immune system of the patients. So, so it's a kind of, you know, win-win strategy. Perhaps I can ask you, Marina, then, for you, is, is it, what's most important for you? Is it the fact that you've got reduced toxicity and therefore increased compliance and the patients like you? <laughs> or is it these exciting new mechanisms of action, the fact you've got possibly a change in the immune response? What, what excites you the most about it? In my opinion, we have to consider all the aspects. Uh, and the, the more we study, the more we are able to discover new potentialities uh, behind the metronomic chemotherapy. 
it is a matter of reduced toxicity because this is a fact and our patients can well understood this fact. But it's not only a matter of reduced toxicity. I think it's a matter of uh, angiogenesis inhibition, as Joseph was saying before. It's a matter on uh, an action on the tumor and micro microenvironment, and this is the only important mechanism of action behind. And all these uh, things, uh, you know, lead uh, to efficacy of metronomic chemotherapy. Mm. So, I, I mean, we have a very active drug or a very active regimen with reduced toxicity and with behind a lot of uh, helps uh, mm. given by other mechanisms. Um, anyway, if you mechanism. provide that, you, you reduce the toxicity, you maintain a patient, you know, on the long term under treatment, and, and we all know that uh, every time you got to postpone a course of chemotherapy because it's too toxic and you got to delay the, the associated radiotherapy, it's going to be deleterious in terms of yeah. survival. Yeah. So, so you're saying that basically getting rid of that extended rest period is very beneficial. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's sure. It's a very interesting Rest topic yeah. because mm -hmm. uh, the immunological effect maybe could uh, aid with the new uh, treatments uh, with sure. the immunotherapy. Sure. We, we, maybe it's, uh, the, the mechanism we, action is different, but I think that it's uh, an area that we, we mm -hmm. can work. But Peter, I know you're desperate to get in. Yes, uh, because it obviously works in a different fashion than standard chemotherapy. Uh, it's what Joseph said. But I think. The most important fact is that we actually are talking about metronomic chemotherapy in patients who are treated in palliative setting. We are not talking about curative setting, but palliative setting. And we already know, and there are a lot of papers showing that patients with breast cancer benefit if they continue on chemotherapy. We don't give like six, <laughs> eight courses of chemotherapy and then like vacation for six months, looking whether the disease relapses or not, whether it progresses or not, we know that it's a better way to treat the patients in a continuous fashion. Mm -hmm. And with MTD, we have no choice to do this. Mm -hmm. With metronomic chemotherapy, we can keep our patients on the chemotherapy for like yeah one year or yes, two years, yes. so yeah. long yeah. as the disease Definitely. responds to the, the treatment. The, the idea is that the chronic disease has to be treated chronically. Yeah. That, that's but that's a major it. mindset change, isn't it, I think? Many, yes, many, indeed. certainly many physicians, mm -hmm. I think, would never have thought about cancers being treated as a chronic disease. Yeah. It was something that you uh, needed to deal yeah. with immediately. 100 years ago, <clears throat> the median survival of patients with diabetes was six months. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good point. Now it's a yeah. chronic disease. The yes. median survival is like 70 years. Yeah. As long yeah. as the mm -hmm. normal people healthy live. We have the same goal. Yeah. 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 So and we have to use other options. I think what's yeah. most exciting for me is the fact that you're seeing with this reduced dose that the, that it, the chemotherapy is working in a very different way, possibly mm -hmm. yeah. through all the, all, the, all the mechanisms that you're talking about. That, and that's yeah. fairly, fairly exciting and yeah. groundbreaking stuff. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a different way, and it seems that it's it's uh, the the same drug working in a different uh, way, and uh, we can uh, we can have this difference mechanism of action uh, to prolong the treatment or combine with other kind of the therapies. Okay, well, um, so should we go and talk data? Because I know you all like talking <laughs> about data and preclinical data, yeah. in, in particularly. Um, so, as far as I understand, metronomic chemotherapy, um, perhaps I could start with you here, Pedro. Uh, is it right that it started from a pediatric point of view, using lower doses for children, you know, because yes. of their body mass index? Hey, but uh, uh, we really discovered the, the, the metronomic uh, therapy after the participating in, a, in a, a maintenance therapy for breast cancer uh, with the problems to use the conventional uh, treatments, and uh, but after the the the, the know this mechanism and the know the the, the profile of this this treatment, we uh, we start the treatment uh, with metronomic uh, in in the patients uh, in the early lines uh, before, and uh, after know that uh, we have uh, a uh, scheme of the treatment with a good profile, we we offer this kind of treatment in more patients. So, Ma Ma Marina, sorry, I was going to ask, what, where did the rationale for this metronomic chemotherapy come from then? So, obviously, in pediatrics, you're using lower doses. We were using these maximum tolerated doses. Where did this suddenly spring out of? 
thank you for this question because I think it's a very key point, this one. We have now preclinical data, very clear preclinical data, which clearly shows us that if you use the same drug on a cancer cell line, same drug but with different administration, so it means high doses and you remove the drug from the texture, or you can leave the drug in, uh, in the texture, in, in the cell lines culture. The same drug acts in two different words. The first one is the MTD model, the second one is the metronomic model. But the concentration of drugs used hmm. in the metronomic way are ten, ten, tenfold less than the other used in the classical way. But <clears throat> and that's the second wonderful thing. At the same doses, you are able to have inhibition of endothelial cells, it means mm -hmm. vascular cells, endothelial cells, and the cancer cells at the same time with the same dose. And this is one of the most important data we have published. Well, that, that's extraordinary. Perhaps I could throw it open to, to all of you then. Mm -hmm. So what sort of protocols have been designed then for metronomic chemotherapy? That's a big issue. Because, Is it? Yeah, because it's very complicated to Why? define. Well, because um, defining what's a, a high dose is very simple. There is a single answer, it's MTD. and every MTD, so basically you, you titrate up until they can't yeah, tolerate yes. anymore. Yeah, yeah yes. definitely. And you got phase, you design phase one to determine what is your MTD. But defining what is a small dose, it's very tricky. Nobody has the answer, actually. What is, what is a small dose? Is it one-tenth of one-hundredth or, or, or less or more than the MTD? So, so, right. So, so you've got, you got such, a, such a variety in low doses to, uh, to choose from, you know? That, that makes defining the optimal protocol tricky. Yes, so, okay, what now pro we have the optimal biological dose which uh, can yes. help us uh, to yeah, define which is the dose definitely. that we can consider as a metronomic dose. Yeah. And how did you ascertain the optimum biological dose, given that you said it works through all these different yeah. things, reducing angiogenesis, the fact that you might be looking at... Not some only angiogenesis, the, the target can vary from drug to drug, but you must have a biological effect. It means the drug concentrations by which you are able to obtain a biological effect. Uh, this is the optimal biological dose. I want to bring in Peter. Uh, I, I agree that it, it's difficult. It's difficult yeah. because uh, uh, the biological dose, effective biological dose, it's, uh, it's based in uh, preclinical data that we sure. have. But yeah. So in protocols for breast cancer, I'm uh -huh. sticking with breast cancer, what, what's, what has been identified in terms of protocols? Does it vary country to country? Yeah. It's, uh, it's identified in the, we have several uh, phase one trials, phase two trials, and we have a pharmacokinetic trials, uh, studies that uh, offer the, the, the stable concentrations and a metronomic, uh, uh, a metronomic uh, use. But, uh, and we have uh, schemas with uh, uh, the drugs that we can use in metronomic, uh, vinorelvine, uh, capsaitabine, metotexate, uh, is it establishing more or less the dose of the binolabin in metronomic uh, uh, studies in combination or alone? Uh, but uh, I think that uh, we need more uh, <laughs> studies in, uh, uh, to know the really optimal biologic dose, pharmacokinetic uh, studies, pharmacodynamic studies. Uh, I, I think that it's, it's necessary. Even if uh, I think that in clinics at least uh, we have uh, ideas much more clear than uh, some years ago, for example. Mm -hmm. Three years ago we didn't know yes. which was uh, the optimal dose, for example, of uh, vinorel being in combination or yeah, single with... agent or uh, cyclophosphamide or so on. Now I think that we have sufficient data in the clinical and practice. And this is data from trials? From trials. Uh, mainly from trials, yes, from clinical mm. setting. I think oh, it's important yes. because, uh, I don't know how to say, but uh, we proved to have uh, some uh, small doses. Uh, we didn't know at that time uh, that uh, that doses uh, were the right ones. Mm. But now we know. Now we have a lot of patients treated with the, yeah, this yeah. kind of okay. therapy. But so, the, field is, on, the field is getting more and more complicated because we have several different mechanisms of actions. We try to combine different agents together. We try to combine uh, <laughs> molecularly targeted agents that, for example, act on the immune system in a different way. So we are already not sure how they will 
stick together, how they will influence the function of immune system, the function of uh, uh, endothelial cells. Mm. So the field is getting really yeah. complicated. Yes. And, and we, we have really robust data <coughs> on yeah. single agent metronomic chemotherapy. Yes. But once we start <laughs> to combine, uh, it's really uh, not that easy to say what is the optimal dose. Mm. We will see in clinics, in clinical practice, the different uh, centers use different uh, approaches, combining yeah. uh, different drugs together, and they have experienced that it <laughs> works. Yes, yeah. Yeah. but what does the science that's, say, that's, Joseph? Well, that, 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 that's a key issue because that's been uh, one of the main limitation of the widespread use of metronomics for years because, uh, as, as Marina said before, uh, Everything was very empirical. Everybody was working on a trial and error practice, you know. Mm. And and for a, a given disease and a given drug, even given as a, as a single agent, if you look at the literature, you got you know such a diversity of, of protocols, all being claiming <coughs> being metronomics, you know. So so I guess that for non-believers, physicians, they would say, oh come on, this is too complicated because I don't know what to start for, you know, yes. for instance. So indeed, yeah, we, we are trying to to put some more. Rational, you know, and to, to and, and solid data to 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 really understand uh, what's the best dosing, what's the best scheduling, and how long should we treat patients? You know, in my case, we we, we are uh, using a lot of mathematics, you know, mathematical models to try to help us to define the best strategy because you've got so many possible combinations. That absolutely, and I assume uh, huge interpatient variability. Definitely, as well. yes, mm -hmm. yes, there, that's another issue. But that's the the interpatient variability comes from the fact that. Uh, quite often, metronomics uh, is going to be used after that MTD standard treatment has failed. So basically, you treat patients uh, that have been previously heavily pretreated with huge impact in terms of uh, the immune system, in terms of uh, 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 different drugs that have been used before that could have maybe selected, you know, uh, resistant clones and so on and so on. So that's another caveat, you know, of the, of the current situation. Mm. But we, we, we're trying to, to be more rational in the way we, we define metronomics and, and the, the minimum biology, biologically effective <coughs> dose is a, is a very good mean, for instance, to define the best dosing. Pharmacometrics is, is, yeah. is another very yeah. good, uh, very good so strategy. Even if I, I would like to add that uh, now we have a meta-analysis, mm -hmm. so it means that we have a sufficient data to be put together and to produce a more uh, robust uh, scientific evidence. So we now have a meta-analysis mm -hmm. based on clinical trials, yeah. and we have uh, international guidelines because right. now, <coughs> since uh, two years ago. Metronomic chemotherapy is recommended by international guidelines, or mm -hmm. at least it is an option. They it's say. an option. <laughs> okay, but they consider. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I can just ask yes. you a very generic question here, which is that given that you've reduced your dose, though, over the period of, co of treating a patient, is the actual dose. <coughs> have you no. given more chemotherapy to patients with, with, um, with metronomic mm -hmm. than you would have done with standard chemotherapy? over the course mm. of the patient's treatment? Yes. I, I, I think that it's, uh, the metronomic uh, chemo does not increase the burden of the, of the, of the chemo. Uh, and I think that it's in the in context of the oral treatments. Uh, the patient don't need to, uh, uh, to see the oncology units and the patient got uh, follow the treatment at home. And I think that uh, the, the, the feeling of the patient is not that the metronomic uh, therapy, oral metronomic therapy, is, uh, is, uh, is a way to increase the burden of the chemotherapy. Right. And I, I think that it's uh, in the context that uh, we have uh, more and more oral drugs and uh, metronomic kids in, 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 in this line. Um, perhaps I could just, um, just ask about the, the fact that this is very much, from what I'm hearing, that you're very much at the beginning of this process of working out what is the right dose, how you combine it when you've got multiple agents and so on. Yeah. But biomarkers, is, this, it, is there a role to play f to measure whether yeah, metronomic we, we, we need to learn how to select patients. Right. Frankly, uh, and once again, from, from, my, from my point of view, from my ex experience, uh, uh, the immune system plays a lot, you know, uh, because we, we, we observe when, when, you, when we switch to a metronomic uh, regimen, uh, at least in lung cancer, for instance, we observed uh, quite a huge variability 
in terms of response. And some patients are just performing amazingly. I mean, you know, uh, patients who are entering the clinical trial with a very, very poor prognosis, mm. and they got this long-lasting response, and are still alive, you know, sometimes more for years mm. after, after starting the, 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 the metronomic chemotherapy. And, and on the contrary, some of the patients uh, probably if I seem to, to, to have totally failed, you know, and, 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 and from these particular cases, the metronomics uh, didn't work. And, and, and uh, I want to try to, to figure out uh, why this, this, uh, this variability. We just observed, you know, we look at the lymphocyte counts at the very beginning. And as I said before, most of the patients were heavily pretreated. And that induces a huge variability in terms yep. of, of, of uh, immunity. And because we believe that, at least in part, metronomics has something to do with immunomodulation and, and, uh, and uh, uh, depleting the T-Rex and, and, uh, and uh, increasing the CD4, CD8, and filtration in tumors and so on, uh, um, if, if the patients uh, have uh, such a bad you know, uh, immune system because of the previous MTD chemo, Metronomics has less chance to succeed that you know a patient with I don't know if you if you agree with this. It's, it's very difficult. It's yeah. the biomarkers. Maybe we have uh, the nowadays all that uh, liquid biopsy that mm -hmm. we can use uh, for metronomic, but it's difficult. We have not markers for for example I, I, immunotherapy. Immuno, immuno monitoring could help maybe. Um, yeah, but uh, it seems that the future of biomarkers is still somewhere <laughs> really in the future mm -hmm. because but uh, we have to make our choices to to decide whether or not to give metronomic chemotherapy to our patients yeah. in a clinical practice nowadays mm -hmm. so sometimes we use very uh, obvious uh, markers or biomarkers like for example grading so we mm -hmm. know that we can expect uh, response from low-grade tumors, mm -hmm. like the grade one breast cancer, in the case of grade three rapidly progressing breast cancer, rather the chance to respond to the single agent monothera monotherapy, metronomic chemotherapy is much lower. So we look in the clinical practice at the KI-67 proliferation index, at the mitotic index, at the grading, and some of those uh, informations can drive us toward the uh, metronomic Okay, well, you, br you brought it up. Let's just look at the scientific literature. So, particularly in metastatic breast cancer, um, what kind of drugs can you use at this point? Or is it just really that you've, you've got a metastatic disease, it's unresponsive? Would, what would you do at this point? Uh, you mean what drugs can we use yeah. as metronomics? Yes. Well, actually, we have uh, three major drugs that are used. Uh, uh, in a daily practice, combined or as monotherapy, so it's venerelbin, mm -hmm. capsidabin, cyclophosphamide, and uh, sometimes metotrexate. And uh, those drugs are used really often in those patients who are candidates for metronomic chemotherapy. And how do the patients tolerate that? Well, actually, as it was already said, uh, metronomic chemotherapy is a really non-toxic uh, treatment strategy. I mean, we don't give the drug at the maximum tolerated doses. So we don't see uh, profound toxicity. We don't mm -hmm. even see uh, alopecia in our patients. Amazing. So sometimes for our uh, female patients who come to us, and this is the uh, main problem. Of course. That they don't want to lose their hair. And we can offer the treatment that uh, saves it. Well, surely that's not just a scientific argument to use metronomics, but also it's a humanitarian reason, isn't for it? Sure. Yeah. For sure. Quality of life. Quality of life. Quality of life, disease control, the possibility mm. to have a chemotherapy at home, yes. to stay with the lovers and mm. uh, go to the hospital just once uh, per month. It's a very yeah, easy way to administer mm. chemotherapy. We, we can offer an active treatment with very low toxicity, it's a very good yeah. therapeutic index. And is there a particular class of drugs that you prefer to use in metronomic administration, or really, is there really anything that you could We have to use to? all the options. I yeah. mean, mm -hmm. yes. this is a chronic treatment. Yeah. Uh, the best way is to treat the patients till the end of their life. Mm. Uh, but the life should not be ended by disease, disease but some <laughs> other comorbidities. Going back to yeah, treating a chronic disease yeah. with mm -hmm. chronic sure. uh, medication, yes. It's, it's one of the options. and. Uh, it's uh, an option, and uh, we, we mean in this option more and more and more. Even if we have uh, some data that uh, some uh, 
drugs work better than other drugs. Mm. In my opinion, uh, the idea that drug must be an oral drug because patients mm -hmm. have, uh, I think that uh, we all agree on this point. Probably there are old chemotherapy, metronomic chemotherapy regimens uh, and uh, newer one with uh, higher activity. We have uh, some data in Italy where the use of metronomic chemotherapy grew up from um, 20, uh, um, uh, 2010 to until uh, 2015 and yeah. uh, 2015. And for example, the use of metronomic chemotherapy increased from 15% mm. until 40%. It means that it works. So what do, um, just out of interest, what do oncologists think when they start using metronomic chemotherapy for the first time? Because clearly that's a huge mindset change for the <laughs> physician. Yeah, it's, 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 they it's, are skeptical. Skeptical, yeah. scared. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, they yeah. are afraid. But when they try, yeah, I but, think yeah. that... Uh, they, they, they're afraid to underdose the patients. To, yes. sorry. to underdose the patients. Yeah. Yes. That the disease will progress rapidly mm -hmm. yeah. without proper yes. chemotherapy. Yes. And this is one point that I would like to underline because a lot of oncologists are looking at <laughs> serum mm. markers mm. like mm. CA 15.3 yeah. mm. and in the case of metronomic chemotherapy we often see a marker rebound in the very beginning yeah. like in the first four six weeks of treatment mm -hmm. we see a huge increase yeah. in the level of the yeah. marker and many oncologists are afraid, well, yeah. this is the progression, so we have to stop. Yeah. Mm. Oh, do they? So they stop because the markers yeah. have yes. gone up? Yeah, because you've got the delay response with metronomics. Yeah. You know, the response is to be delayed as compared yeah. with MTD. It's but quite you, you, the you've got to be patient, you've got, you've got to trust. So really, there's a whole uh, role to be played here on educating the, the clinicians themselves mm -hmm. and actually sure. treating the yeah. clinicians. Don't sure. be afraid of the, bi of the marker. Mm -hmm. Look yeah. at the clinical status Well, we were always taught, sure. don't, don't treat mm -hmm. the markers, treat the patient. Look at the symptoms. Yeah. Mm. And if the symptoms are not there, it means just wait. Mm. It's quite the same that uh, now happens uh, with uh, immunotherapy. You can have uh, the so-called uh, apparent disease progression mm -hmm. in uh, the two months of treatment. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, in this way, metronomic chemotherapy is um, closer to um, immunotherapy because mm -hmm. Uh, Piotr, I, I, I agree with him because you can observe some kind of uh, sort, um, of, sort of progression. Yeah, but it's not a real progression. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you can yes, continue the treatment, uh, you can uh, stay on treatment for mm -hmm. a very long period of time. Okay, perhaps we could now move then to talking about clinical practice generally. So in Italy, um, how do you use metronomic chemotherapy in breast cancer? Is it something that you would use? to begin with, or is it something you would only use in metastatic breast cancer when you've exhausted MTD? Yeah. Um, I think that uh, the, the scientific data tell us that we have to use a first in the metastatic setting. We do not have so much uh, data, so many data in the adjuvant setting. So, so the reason to start message, in metastatic is yeah, because sure. they have already reached the end of what is possibly um, efficacious? No, I don't think so, but uh, we have too few data in the new adjuvant and adjuvant setting, okay. but we have a lot of data in the metastatic setting. The second message is that uh, we have a big amount of data in, uh, in those tumors uh, which express uh, the uh, hormone receptors. So the second key message is that uh, a clinician can start uh, to prove uh, metronomic chemotherapy, I use uh, in my clinical setting, I use metronomic chemotherapy in ER positive patients, metastatic patients. Um, when endocrine treatment, for example, has failed. Right. As a first line chemotherapy. So you try endocrine first, would you, as your first sure. line? Sure. Yeah. And then if it fails, you would then move on yes. to metronomic? Yes. And yeah. Peter, is that what you do in Poland? Uh, it depends. I mean, not all. <laughs> uh, we, we, we have like the luminal A and the luminal B uh, breast cancer tumors and luminal B are more aggressive. And sometimes, especially in Poland, because in Poland the CDK4-6 inhibitors are not reimbursed, so we cannot give them together with endocrine treatment. Oh. Sometimes if the disease is not really slow, we try to combine metronomic chemotherapy with endocrine treatment because there is some data uh, on that. Uh, showing that this kind of approach is really active, 
and we see really profound responses and long-lasting. So that's quite interesting that your clinical practice varies not only just from data, but also because of the healthcare systems that you're in. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Um, and what, what happens yes. in Spain? In Spain, the, the, the situation is very similar to that in, in Italy. And uh, five, ten years ago, maybe the use of methanolamic therapies was only a, uh, five percent residual, but uh, nowadays uh, uh, we we have uh, 15, 20 percent of the patients with uh, methanolamic therapy in breast cancer, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, the majority of the oncologists uh, before started uh, this kind of treatment in late lines after the other lines was exhausted, uh, four or five lines, but when the, the, our colleagues uh, see that the, the, the methylomic therapy work, uh, uh, start the treatment yeah, before. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's a treatment that uh, work without uh, toxicity. And uh, I think that uh, we have uh, m m the use in second or third line, more, more early lines at this moment. That That's method. interesting. Yeah. So you're obviously huge advocates. Perhaps, Joseph, I can come to you. So it's pretty much the same in France. Uh, metronomics is on the rise in breast cancer, lung cancer, pediatrics. And is this as, as uh, oncologists become more au fait with it, as they become more comfortable with it, more confident? Well, uh, since, since you, you, we started to present metronomics as, as a possible strategy to increase Increase or to uh, rake the, the immunity system of the patients, you know, it, it tends to be a trendy strategy because <laughs> because everybody wants to uh, to go for the for the immune checkpoint inhibitors. And for instance, yeah. uh, we have several trials investigating on how metronomic uh, chemotherapy could be combined with anti PD one or anti CTL four or anti PD L one. You know, all these new drugs, everybody is is, is pretty much excited about. Uh, um, so th that's why metronomics is, is getting, uh, you know, a, a deeper interest from the medical community. Uh, I think that um, we are moving as well, you know, towards some kind of, you know, hybrid, um, hybrid uh, regimen where basically you can start by, by MTD and then you, you can right. switch to to metronomics and maybe you can you can try to combine metronomics with targeted therapies. So I was going to say what is your what are the biggest obstacles currently to using metronomic chemotherapy? Well, in, at least from my point of view, uh, once again, it was the lack of consistency in, in, the, in what has been published for, for, for nearly 15 years now. It's getting better now, you know, because as Marina put it, you know, okay, we, we are we are getting into a better understanding of what is the best keto mm. and dosing and so on and so on. And, but clearly, we, we still have some, you know, skeptical physicians who just don't buy it because, because they've been taught, you know, when they were at the uni, okay, that you need to hit very, very uh, heavily uh, and you need to, to punch. Mm. Uh, and and uh, it's going to take a while, you know, to, um, you know to, uh, to change the mindset. So are you starting to see across Europe in different countries this guidelines being produced saying you should start like this, you should move mm -hmm. to this at this point? Are, there, are the countries more or less the same or is, it, or is this very much... A, a new, it's getting new better. dawn. Mm. Yeah, it's getting better, but it's, uh, it's getting better. But there is country intercountry yes. variability. <laughs> yeah. yes. Considerable. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think so. Um, you know, there are uh, some uh, some countries that have uh, particular realities. Uh, for example, for economical reasons. Yes. Uh, for. Uh, different reasons and different from uh, the scientific uh, reasons. Uh, that's why we need uh, um, we need to continue to product uh, data and uh, to cooperate uh, yeah. uh, among different countries in Europe, but not only inside Europe, also mm. with uh, different realities, because uh, you know there are uh, uh, different needs coming from different countries. It's well, not only a matter of scientific data. Well, and I suppose there's not just an ideal patient profile, but as you say, the countries are different. They have different GDPs. They have yeah. different amounts mm -hmm. of money but they can spend on healthcare. Sure. But I think that in the next years uh, we have uh, the metronomic uh, uh, treatments in the guidelines, and uh, I think that in the next two, three, four years. We, we can uh, offer also the, the data of the phase three trials. And I think that uh, we have more data and uh, the variability in the context could decrease. Mm. Yeah. One of, one of the issues was the lack of comparative trials for yeah. years, you know. 
Yeah. Because at some some point, physicians need to have evidence, and 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 we have all been told that the phase three comparative trial is the ultimate evidence. But it's it's quite complicated to mm. just to fund and to, to find the money, the sponsor. Well, I was so going to say, it's it's you, and it's not just the physicians having that data, is it? It's the people who pay for it as well, the people who, who allocate yes, the budget. Yes. But actually, in breast cancer, we have really a convenient situation looking at the international guidelines yes. on the treatment of advanced breast cancer because uh, there is no defined first, second, third line of treatment. Mm. Yeah. There is an array of, of options. And no one writing those guidelines shows that this is a proper, <laughs> yeah. proper option. Which, as you say, this, is a great benefit. So you have to choose. Right. Yeah. You have to look right. at the patients, you have to look at the disease, and you have to choose what's the most convenient treatment in this situation. Right. Because other, nevertheless, you will have to use all those options that you have. Yeah. Um, well, let me, let me just ask you then. So in terms of metronomic chemotherapy, is there an ideal patient for you? Is there someone who walks through your door and you think they are absolutely perfect for this? In my opinion, the ideal patient is the patient with a not so high burden of disease first, ER positive because we have very few data in triple negative breast cancer. First line is fine for me because I think that now the data is sufficient. Really? Yeah. And what about you, well, gentlemen? We can offer in the first line if the patient has not uh, symptomatic disease. Uh, sure. Yes, but without symptomatic disease or, or a patient, for example, Indolent. with a bone disease only mm -hmm. uh, or a little lung disease, uh, mm, I think that it's a good candidate for mm -hmm. offer a treatment with metronomic therapy. And in Poland? Well, actually the same. I mean, uh, <laughs> asymptomatic uh, patients. The best patients are patients without visceral metastases. So then we are sure we have time. And even though there can be progression, the progression will be not uh, important for the patient. I mean, the, yeah. from the uh, point of view of the, their health. Right. I mean, because it will be not, uh, uh, W the patients will be not at risk of dying because of yeah. the progression, sure. so we'll have the chance to switch the treatment yeah. and choose other okay. options. Yeah. And, and what about for yourself? Yeah. The same grading has to be not too, uh, not too bad. The right. The patient not need intensive therapy. Well, I was going to say also, surely there's a, there's a role here, particularly when you're looking after elderly people, that must be a very important role to play, where you're giving drugs at a far less toxic dose that they can tolerate and they will take and you have good compliance. Yeah. And we have data about the quality of life as well, so yes. we are sure that we are we are delivering them uh, something that is uh, active, I mean efficacious, with uh, not so much toxicity, with the quality of life uh, preservation, and uh, not so expensive is uh, if compared with uh, the new yeah, drugs. Uh, mm -hmm. I so, think. So yeah. uh, just just picking up on that, I mean, it must have a massive impact on low-income countries to have to have treatments available, mm -hmm. which you take at home. You have less monitoring. You have less mm -hmm. hospital visits sure. or fewer yeah. hospital visits. It's old drugs, sorry, old and cheap drugs. Exactly, old, old and yeah. cheap yeah. drugs, which you take orally. Yeah. It must yes. make a major this difference to the healthcare. India, for instance, India is one of the leading country in metronomics. That's interesting. Or Africa, yeah, yes, as well. And what's the data showing that in India? They got good results in pediatrics. They got amazing results at the Mumbai hospital, for instance, the Tata Hospital in Mumbai. And they got you know so many patients to treat, and they are they are 100 for metronomics. For, for at least for, and partly I mean for, 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 for economical reasons, you know, yeah. it's cheap. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the thing is also, that maybe there are less constraints in India in terms of, yes. well, I know yeah. having yeah. worked mm -hmm. in India that mm -hmm. things are not quite as they might be in mm -hmm. certain European countries. It's an efficient treatment. Yes. Yeah, of course. Well, that's extraordinary. Um, so let's let's then think about the, the patient's view, because clearly all the clinicians, you're all very excited by this metronomics. Yeah. Um, but um, what what... When you see a patient, you know, obviously when you're given this diagnosis, it's fairly devastating. I assume being able to give them metronomic chemotherapy means actually you're not going to destroy their lives in quite the same way as a maximum therapeutic dose. Mm -hmm. Sure. We are able to offer uh, an active treatment for their disease without, uh, for example, obliging, obliging them to, to come to the hospital every week, for example, in the case of weekly treatments. Mm. They can stay at home, they can work. For example, if you think about younger women with breast cancer, 
they can continue to work and yes. to take care of uh, their lovers, their family, and at the same time receive an active treatment. I think it's not a, only an option for frail or elderly people. Because in the past we thought that metronomic chemotherapy is something not so efficacious as a metronomic uh, maximum tolerated dose chemotherapy was. But now I think that the something is uh, deeply changing. But I think also there must be such an important pro-psychological uh, thing happening here. Because I remember when I was doing oncology and making sure that you know all these ladies particularly came back every week, they become their diagnosis. They no longer exist as their person in their own right. And so I assume by allowing them to take their drugs at home, where you have less medical intervention, <laughs> they can remember they are human yeah, and yeah, have yeah. a real life and sure. children and everything. Yes. Yes. Sure. But we can prolong the time that the patient do not need to the hospital visit, the patient can't yeah. uh, work, the patient can't uh, uh, have a normal life. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They can take holidays and they can go to the cinema, to the mean, restaurant. Life yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the normal life is really it's important because, <laughs> for, yeah. for example, we um, know, and there is a lot of data showing that physically active breast cancer patients, not only breast okay. cancer, but I talk now about breast cancer, can decrease their risk of dying by more than 50%. Yeah. Yeah. But they have to be really uh, physically active four times a week approximately 180 minutes uh, so how they can they do this when you're on the MTD you can't mm -hmm. yeah. it's impossible so the metronomic chemotherapy also opens a door the door for really normal active life that can have a profound yeah. positive yeah. impact of yes. on your uh, survival. And also, I'm a great believer in positive psychology, patients actually yeah, believing sure. they can get better. And you can't do that with MTD when you feel mm -hmm. dreadful yeah. the whole time. For example, mm -hmm. there is no need for blood tests as so often as uh, with um, MTD chemotherapy. So you can have a uh, patients can have a blood test once per month. Uh, and I think this is so important. It's amazingly well. important. Sure. But what about compliance? And I mean, I assume patients are pretty compliant. No, no, They're no, not? Not necessarily. Well, yeah, it's a big mistake to think that, well, I mean, no, no, I'm not talking about uh, specifically uh, metronomic chemotherapy, but that's true for oral targeted therapies, for instance. It's not because a patient has a, a very serious disease, and even if you, you try to explain him or her, okay, that it's very important to take the pills regularly, sometimes, I, can, I can't remember the figures, but it was as huge as something like 20% of the patients, they just don't care, you know, and they won't be compliant, and that's... that's uh, they that's don't care because they feel it's hopeless? No, because well, you got the what what we call the the, the pill fatigue, or basically, you know, patients mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. they want to f forget about that, you know. Yeah, and they say, okay, this is the weekend. Okay, okay, but I don't take the, the medicine yeah, anymore. We have very strong d data on the lack of mm, compliance of mm -hmm. compliance in patients treated in adjuvant setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they are supposed to be cured, mm -hmm. and this is oh. just prophylaxis. Yeah. And uh, in the case yeah. of palliative setting, mm -hmm. when the countdown is on, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so they, they know they more, okay. they, if they stop mm -hmm. the treatment the disease will, will Come progress. Come back with a vengeance. So, you know, the setting is really important. Adjuvant mm -hmm. and palliative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, so for, the, for the patient, when the patient starts with the intravenous treatment, the, the patient feels that the situation is totally different. Mm. I, think, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, uh, you know, obviously the science behind it is very exciting, but I think also, you know, this, this really, this final point is, is the crux of the matter, which is that if you're improving patients' quality of life, that has to be, and you're also making the disease better, that's the key to this, isn't mm -hmm. it? Because they're going to be on site, yeah. take the tablets, sure. feel better, have positive yeah, psychology, yeah. and therefore so we probably will get better. In palliative setting, we have two major goals prolongation of survival and maximization of quality of life. Mm. And we cannot stick to just one of those goals. We have to follow both goals of course. Uh, at the same time. Well, that's really good to hear. But I mean, so clearly, I mean, I get the sense that we're very much at the beginning of a rather long journey here with metronomic chemotherapy. So what's the future hold? What are the next steps? Where do we go from here? I think the next step is uh, to have the results of the first three flyers and uh, the new combinations with the uh, metronomic hemotherapy, with immunotherapy or in the, yes. with uh, angiogenic uh, therapies. And uh, I think that in the next uh, three, four years, we will be more data for use more and more the, uh, the metronomic therapies. So is it a matter of sharing more country data? from country to country? Yes, yes, definitely. Now we have uh, 
all, all our countries, for example, in comparison to some years ago, uh, have uh, hero, uh, its own data. So it's a uh, time to share the data among us. Last, uh, last year we had a very nice expert meeting with uh, some colleagues and some, some other colleagues who are not uh, here today and it was a really a very good experience because we put some statements and we voted on the statements and we took um, a common, uh, we, we shared the common idea on a particular topic mm. because I think that now we have quite clear ideas about metronomic chemotherapy. Uh, in addition to what uh, Pedro said, um, I think that the future, for sure, we need the randomized trials. But I think if they will not come because of many reasons, we don't know what will be the future for big trials no, with no. a big number of patients. I think that we have to put our forces together trying to define which is the better patient profile. And mm. we can do this by sharing the clinical practice by collecting, for example, a big collection of all European cases. For example, in Italy we collected 600 patients treated with metronomic chemotherapy. And now we have ideas much more clear than, uh, than in the mm. past. But I assume, so. I assume you mentioned clinical trials. Are there clinical trials, lots of clinical trials yeah. going on across Europe, in Poland? Mm -hmm. Uh, not that many in metronomic chemotherapy right. because, as it was, it was already said, uh, there are no sponsors that are really interested in sponsoring <laughs> clinical trial in pure metronomic chemotherapy. Of course, there are some trials combining metronomic chemotherapy with novel targeted mm. agents, mm. but it's not just the agents, uh, not the backbone that is the metronomic chemotherapy. That's very interesting. And I think that. Uh, uh, we have uh, several trials uh, that are closed. For example, the, the results for a Victor three, the results uh, we are participating in a Maverick trial. Maverick. Uh, the Victor Gan, the French yes, one. And, uh, and I think that uh, only in, uh, in two or three years we can can have uh, results of a comparative trials that put uh, in the context the, the use of the, of the metronomic uh, oh, therapies. And Joseph, what, what's next steps for you, you know, as my pharmacologist? <laughs> what do you want to say? Well, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of modeling and algorithm. And I think that, you know, the future of oncology is, is combination therapy. Yeah. And the future of metronomics is combination therapy, I guess. You mm. know, I mean, there is not a single agent or a single strategy that's going to get rid of cancer. So we need to learn how to combine best, you know, uh, radiotherapy, metronomics, MTD regimens, mm, 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 antiandrogenics, mm. immunotherapy, and so on and so on. And because, you know, we've got such a large number of options now, just to find out uh, what's the, the best, the right sequence is, is, is getting harder and harder. Yes. So, you know, it's very trendy to talk about, um, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, for instance. And I'm convinced that, you know, <laughs> using algorithm uh, yeah. and, and feeding algorithm with, you know, a lot of data we could share, for instance, and, and putting some kind of machine learning procedures, we could, we could try to, to, uh, to build some kind of model that's going to, you know, to, uh, to be used as a decision tool you know, to, to tell us for each given patient why, how should we start you know, and what should we start with for, 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 for a start. And, and when, when is it time to switch to something right. else? And when, when, when it's time to switch to something else? And at the end of the day, I mean, the, the, we, we need to, to try everything for a patient. I mean, if we have to try everything for a single patient, that means that the patient has lived for years, you know, just to have the different lines and the different strategies and maybe the new drugs that are going to come. So mm -hmm. I think that the future of metronomics is definitely uh, combination therapy and, and, and especially combination therapy with, with human checkpoint inhibitors. I have to say it's been absolutely fascinating to hear where you are, where the research is going and, and ultimately what it will mean for the patients which mm -hmm. is of course the reason that we're all here. Perhaps Peter, what, what would you, uh, how would you summarise this? What are, what are your key messages to take away with, to take home? Uh, metronomic chemotherapy, this is a real option in clinical practice. Uh, we are now sure that this kind of treatment, this kind of strategy works. Uh, the main goal of this strategy is not to respond 
the main goal of the strategy is stabilization of the disease. So it means that we, our patients, and we should aim to treat our patients who are not symptomatic, who are not at risk of life-threatening events, uh, but there is a lot of such patients. Mm. And metronomic chemotherapy is the best chronic options for chronic patients who are asymptomatic mm. and who mm, have disease that is not rapidly progressing. Right, Pedro. And, and for me, I think that uh, we can offer the patients uh, uh, um, a good uh, combination with uh, uh, low toxicity that can work in the same way that, for example, the conventional therapy, but with uh, low toxicity and that uh, offer an increase in the quality of the life. It's very important and we can prolong also survival and uh, is our, our point of view. I think that we need work in the uh, new combinations, uh, uh, combinations of the methanomic therapy with uh, target therapies or immunotherapy. Mm. It's, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. All about quality of life, improving symptom yeah. control. Joseph. The conclusion? Oh, yeah, it's um, your conclusion. What's yeah, the take, uh, so what's the take home message? Less is more. Less is more, love that. Sounds good. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds extremely good. Marina? Now, we, we need to be more conservative. We need to be more preservative, you know, uh, more conservative you know, with respect to the toxicities. And, and for years, physicians and pharmacologists, we have all been taught that somehow, you know, it had to be toxic yes. to be effective, and we, which is wrong. We, we know it. Well, you know, well a lot has been written about saying that the paradigm that more is better mm -hmm. is wrong, is wrong. Marina? Um, I would like to, co to conclude with uh, one phrase. We are on, we, my colleague, um, all the physicians are on. It means that uh, we are uh, devoted to patients and devoted to knowledge, and this will be the motto of our new upcoming uh, International School of Metronomic Chemotherapy. Fantastic, which is, which is a perfect place to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, indeed. Well, this debate on metronomic chemotherapy in breast cancer, very sadly, is now over. I'd like to say a massive thank you to my wonderful guests for this extraordinary discussion. We'll see you soon for another debate here on MDFM.